talk about geospatial technologies and uh, GPS today. We'll start off talking about Global Navigation Satellite Systems. This is the GNSS that you hear quite a bit about. Uh, and GNSS, Global Navigation Satellite Systems, includes more than just GPS. Okay, it also includes the GLONASS system, which is the Russian sort of equivalent to our GPS system, as well as Galileo, which is the EU, European Union, um, uh, analog to our GPS. Okay, and, and in total, in total, these uh, are the uh, what, what we call GNSS. Um, and that's what I was just uh, referring to: is that there's more than one uh, example of uh, global navigation satellite systems. A brief history of GNSS. Uh, is first of all we have to understand that these are positioning technologies. Every single one of them is a positioning technology trying to um, let us know as accurately, as precisely, I should say as possible, where we are on the Earth's surface. Okay? That sounds like a pretty simple chore, I guess. Um, and back in time, this started, you know, the electronic I guess if you want to call it that, the electronic solutions started with LORAN, and then there was SatNav, and now today our Navstar GPS system. So just very briefly, LORAN was developed during World War II. It's considered a master-slave type of configuration, um, and, but there were problems with it. For instance, um, as, as is shown in this uh, slide right here, what we're seeing is that there are two Loran, Loran beacons okay, that are in use in this little uh, scenario of trying to find out where is this ship. And the ship would be the one trying to find out where am I. Okay? So the captain of the ship saying, where the heck am I? Am I clear to sail through this? Whatever, right? So they're using the Loran system and they can talk to or listen to two of these beacons simultaneously. Or actually, we're switching one then to another, then to another, back and forth, toggling. Um, and the problem that we see here is that the accuracy of that Loran system is indicated by this blue polygon. The error polygon is essentially, you know, pretty darn large. And while it worked pretty well for, for large ships to navigate fairly large waterways, uh, it's not sufficient for someone to, uh, oh, drive their car on their tom-tom, right? Um, not sufficient for a lot of the type of applications that we are trying to um, apply GPS to today. SatNav was the first satellite-based navigation system that was put up by the US. There were problems with it. One of its major problems was the fact that it had a very low orbit in contrast to um, the Navstar system. Navstar system is the name of the satellites for GPS. Um, and because it had that very low uh, orbit, um, the Earth's gravitational pull was pretty strongly felt by those early satellites. And as a result of that, the satellites kept moving closer and closer to Earth. Um, and as you're going to see here in just a little bit, it's really important for those satellites to stay where they're supposed to be. And if we don't know where the satellite is, or the receiver, let's say, doesn't know where the satellite is, it's almost impossible, well, it is impossible to get an accurate location of where we are. So that was a major drawback of the SatNav system. The uh, global positioning system was developed by the Department of Defense at an initial cost of over $10 billion. That is $10 billion, B billion. And it is, just like Loran, just like the SatNav system, it is a triangulation-based technology. Just like using a compass, essentially. Has anyone ever you know, um, heard about how um, wildfires were located? and still are in many cases, how they're located. And the reason why we have lookout towers, had lookout towers, 
still places still in use? Right, so you'd have one lookout tower that says, oh, I see smoke right over there, and they shoot an azimuth from their location, which is a known location, to where they see that smoke. Another one, 20 miles away maybe, or whatever distance, sees that same smoke, but they're in a different location, and they shoot an azimuth, a bearing to that thing, and then the Forest Service personnel say, okay, where do these two lines cross? Because I know where these two... Um, where these two lookout towers are, and they cross over here. Therefore, that must be where we have a fire. Here's the closest road out there. Send some crews out there to try to put out the fire. That's a triangulation-based uh, approach to positioning. Um, in space, it's a little bit different, because now we're dealing with three dimensions. But still, uh, we can apply the same concept to finding out where we are by using uh, satellite-based um, systems like GPS. Um, GPS is considered a critical asset to the United States. It's vital to what they call the, or what's referred to as international security, economic growth, and public safety. A lot of uh, emergency vehicles are using GPS today. Um, GPS extends across all domains, air, land, sea, space, and cyberspace. And uh, the, this affects or transcends national and military boundaries. G, one of the goals of GPS is to be available, reliable, accurate, and very importantly, free of charge to the, uh, to the consumer. So, what's so special about the GPS and its orbit? We said that was a problem with SatNav. SatNav had a low orbit. GPS has a very rather high orbit of 11,000 miles. What's so special about that? Well, first of all, it's considered mathematically perfect. It's far enough out there so that the Earth's gravitational field is considered nil, next to nothing, very small. Of course, you can never get to some point where there is no gravitational pull from anything, right? But it, it's, it's so far out there that it's considered nil, pretty much negligible. And at this orbit, each of the GPS satellites, the space vehicles, SVs, will orbit twice, perfectly, twice per day. Each of those space vehicles will also give us um, a large viewable area. In essence, half of the Earth will be visible at one time to each of those satellites. So, if we walked outside right now, and we look at our horizon, east to west, north to south, and everything, our horizon is everything above, right? Everything above us. Does anyone have any clue of how many satellite or satellite vehicles we would have available or, uh, to us for just from the GPS constellation? Twelve. Yeah, we'd have twelve. Twelve at a minimum. There's actually some more uh, that are out there. We'll talk about those uh, those. Uh, those vehicles as well here in just a little bit. Um, 12 is kind of a good number also. That is why most of our GPS receivers today are 12 channel. We can listen to everything that's on the horizon. Okay? GPS and the importance of great clocks. Believe it or not, GPS determines location by measuring time. Let's see how this works. The triangulation equation. There are three variables we need to be concerned with, similar to our wildfire example. The first is how far is it from our point on Earth to the satellite? Okay, that's the first. How long does it take for the radio wave to travel that distance? And then third, where exactly is the satellite, or are all the satellites. It may sound like a pretty daunting task to try to solve this, but it's not terribly difficult. Kind of ingenious how this works. So, let's say that we're simply listening to one satellite. And in the middle of this bubble here that we see kind of floating over the Earth, in the center of this would be a satellite. And wherever that bubble strikes the Earth's surface, we could be anywhere within that. That's a pretty big area. 
Right? Very, very poor accuracy when we're using one satellite. We really have no clue where we really are. Two satellites, well, what this is saying is that you are probably somewhere inside here. Now think of this in three dimensions. It's a big area. In fact, it could be above the Earth just as well as it could be on the Earth's surface. Three satellites. Now what we've done is we have narrowed this down to a fairly small spot. And in actuality, those, two bu those three bubbles will only intersect at two locations, two points. One of them will be the right answer, the other's the wrong answer. And that wrong answer is going to be um, either well inside the Earth's, or underneath the Earth's surface, or well above the Earth's surface. How do we find out? Fourth satellite. We pick up a fourth satellite, and that fourth satellite's kind of the tiebreaker. When we have four satellites, we're then working on what's called 3D GPS. Three-dimensional, and, and they say three-dimensional because that's the one that says, oh, this other one is wrong that you got up, uh, that puts you, you know, 25 miles above the Earth. Um, and, uh, and it kind of solves that problem. So, by using those four satellites, uh, now let's go back to our equation here. And, and we're going to attack parts one and two simultaneously. How far is it from our point on Earth to the satellite? We use a simple equation here, d equals t times s. Distance equals time multiplied by s, which is the speed of light. I no longer remember the speed of light in miles per hour, kilometers per second, anything like that. Don't even expect you to. But let me tell you, it's really going. Okay? The speed of light is really fast. But you know one thing that's very, very interesting? That has been taken into account in the GPS is that the speed of light truly is not constant. Once that those light waves, the radio waves, which is part of the electromagnetic spectrum, once that enters into an atmosphere, the speed of light varies. And if the GPS system did not take that into account, our accuracy, precision of our positions would be very, very poor. So that is uh, taken into account. And we'll look, look at our error budget uh, here in just a, uh, just a little bit. To understand how we solve this equation, d equals t times s, we need to look at what's called the pseudo-random code. Essentially, it's a series of blips, beeps, silence. And each of these little dark brown bars would indicate uh, a moment of sound. And the, the white indent uh, would be a period of silence. So some sort of sound, essentially, silence, sound, silence, sound, silence. Now, it's called a pseudo-random code, meaning that's a false random code. If you just would listen to it or analyze it with a with computer uh, and try to determine, is this random or not random? Is there some pattern to it? It would really look like it's random. Uh, however, it's not. The, both the satellite and the GPS receivers know what song should be playing right now. Okay? Uh, so it's pseudo-random in, in that way. So if the, um, the receiver is receiving this signal, um, what, it, what it knows is that at this moment in time, this part of the signal should be playing. But if it hears this part, what does it know has happened? But there's a time differential. That it, it's lagging by a certain amount of time. Right? You, you follow me? So if we know, if we can say that, okay, the amount of time that has elapsed between here and here is X number of milliseconds, and then we take the amount of, or the speed of those radio waves, calculate, that's it, time multiplied by the speed.